Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by CoolSomething.com, Mana Traders, as well as Twitch subs and Patreon supporters just like you. My name is Evan Irwin, and get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Power Dragon. Hey, what's up everybody? I'm back and recharged after raising a bunch of money this weekend with the Hunter Burton Memorial Open, so that was fun. Nice, Ruben Bressler. And I am here in my baboon shirt, so <laughs> that's the energy that I'm bringing today. Are we pouring one out for Harambe? Is that still a thing? Do people even <laughs> that know was, what that means? Well, first of all, that's a gorilla. Oh. This is pouring one out for Rafiq. Whoa, fair enough. That's My true. Boy. A that's little bit boy. different. Yeah. That's, that's a fair point. All right. So that said, if you missed our pre-show, patrons and subscribers or people who hung out early got access to that stuff. Uh, and that was pretty awesome. So we kick it off with our first pick. And our code push, get yourself to CoolStuffInc.com. Use the promo code MAGICMIKES to get 5% off your next order. Tell them that we sent you if you want. But use that promo code MAGICMIKES. It keeps us around. It keeps this crazy show happening. Thanks to our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, for sponsoring all this, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day and use the promo code MAGICMIKES while you're doing so. All right. So the online premiere play roundup has changed. Um, it, as with most things, when we start talking about like high level play and X leading to Y and Y leading to Z, you can kind of get lost in the sauce is I think a way to put that. But I think what we discussed in the pre-show was that there's a pretty standard way to look at this, which is more slots. Everything is and more, more money. slots and more money. That's right. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of just all around okay with this. This is one of those announcements where you go, yeah, all right, let's give a golf clap because they kind of got it right. It's just, hey, we're making it a little bit easier for more people to get in. Right. We're making it a little bit easier for people to get access to more money and more people qualify for the Pro Tour. So, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. So there's, you know, less wins and or there's less or there's more losses given to you depending on what you're playing for. Um, you know, they're changing from 200K in prizes to 250K in prizes for the Arena Championship. That's always also the number went up and the dollars are increased. I, I think that's fantastic. Um, and the fact that they've paid out like millions of dollars in these $2,000 rewards across, you know, however mm -hmm. many players for how many years we've been doing this, uh, which I think is just fantastic, you know. And, uh, you know, you kind of wait for the you know, the Paul Chions and, you know, the Mangucci's are just like one of my 2K like over the weekend because because you see it all the time. Yeah. And you're sure. like, damn, y'all are some masters because I'm, I'm never close to that stuff. And that's good. Like, I, I like that this exists and continues to exist. And I, I look forward to seeing the best at what people do get some amount of payment for doing it, mm -hmm. whether that's magic or whether that's whatever competitive creative endeavor uh and magic is no different this being a magic show and our show having been predicated on being founded during the one of the heydays of competitive magic i'm excited that they are giving you know they're opening the gates a little bit wider there's two things too i want to point out that one they did add some extra stuff for magic online as well mm -hmm. so they have like mm -hmm. a creator showcase or something now that they're gonna be trying to bring people in and get them to promote stuff and give them some prizes to get them qualified for things or whatever. So that's kind of cool. And with this arena announcement, pretty much all of them, except for, I think the modern horizons three has a best of one and a best of three on a week apart, almost on all of them, either they're six or seven days apart on each one. So you can play both. You can figure out which one you're better at if you have a preferred thing, but everybody has an opportunity at every one of them. So this announcement checked pretty much all the boxes you could want for the premier play online. Really? Yeah, I, I still think there are there's strides to go, I think, in terms of linking <clears throat> individual players to care about the bigger events or try to somehow get them more invested in some way. This is where back where you you, know, you got a sleeve or something if the if the person you chose, or maybe you know, you choose a color, that's the most played color on the event. Just something to kind of just yeah. give someone who's playing Magic Arena it's like, oh, there's this thing going on. I can tangentially interact with it because right. as we've seen, at least for Marvel Snap right now, they're doing the Twitch drop thing and the numbers for all the, you know, the streamers are insane. And if they could do some Twitch drops, that would also be incredible. Like encourage people to stream, you know, stream your tournament experience, you know, show up on Twitch and get those drops. Let's make that happen. You know, those are the types of things that promotionally I think could really tie in together because as we've seen, 
year over year, time after time, it's so difficult for them to say this premier play program that is expensive, that costs a bunch of money, is actually helping your bottom line in all of these tangential ways. Yeah, yeah. that's just marketing. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And, it. and it's also a matter of like what thing really motivates people. Because, you know, they tried the thing before with like win this trophy pet or whatever it was and get this sleeve and... People seem to like they signed up for it, but then just didn't care. And they just sort of waited for the results, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just like maybe what you're saying is, hey, maybe you got to do something more active. Like, hey, come watch two hours of the stream and get whatever Twitch drop or whatever. Right. Whatever the case may be. And maybe that's better. So you get them to at least actively do a thing to get the reward. That's probably the direction they need to go. Yeah, I need I need some of my wizards to pick up that baton a Twitch drop baton and run it. And I'm talking all the way to the top of the mountain. Tell them it is important. I am telling you game after game. There's a reason there are dozens and dozens of games doing this right now. It works. It's worked every time I've seen it happen. It works on me. I've got a stream pulled up. I can't watch it all day. It's on a tab yeah. in the background, but you know what? I'm popping up as a viewer. So now this person has 5,000 viewers instead of less. You know, I think that's incredible. Oh, uh, yeah. I need, I need somebody who was just to really champion that. I swear to God. Yeah. I mean, I imagine it's very hard. You know, oh, yeah. you're competing against every other game uh on the platform and people who aren't playing games the just chatting segment of twitch is the biggest on twitch so you know it's very difficult to get front page it's very difficult to get all of that stuff so it's unrelated note f twitch on their like feature of if i have that tab and i switch over to something else i gotta come yeah. back and finish the damn commercial yeah, like what's that rough. bs that's like hilarious. literally i'm like okay i'm 10 seconds in the commercial there's like 20 more let me go check an email real quick and I come back and I'm like, why are there still 19 seconds of a commercial? Like, what, what, what? Like, like, so now I have to watch Twitch on a whole separate browser window. So it's always the tab that's open or else you get stuck watching all the commercials. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, Mr. Bezos is removing 10% of value from Prime subs starting in like June. So that also yeah. stinks. Uh, and while yeah, we're talking a, about it, them dangling primes, you can subscribe to our Twitch channel right now. It's some type of weird trade-off where, like, it's going to be easier to get a higher percentage on each of those, but they're also making each base one 10% less. So it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah it's not <laughs> easy. But, you know, I want there to be, you know, high-level play. I, I miss Grand Prix. Hell, the, the, most, the thing I miss the most is the coverage. You know, the fact that Ruben and I helped build this awesome coverage thing that happened and lived and breathed until four years ago, basically, this week. And that's when everything stopped. And... You know, these past four years, it's it, it was wild. At least for the first two, it almost just felt, like, surreal. You know what I mean? Like, everything was happening. You couldn't really go anywhere. Stuff kind of came out. Pre-release at home. You know what I mean? Just, like, everyone going nuts over the collector market there for a while. You know, all of that stuff kind of happening. The whole the paradigm shift of what organized play means to Magic is what's happened over the last four years. And that entire shift of to Command Fest and MagicCon, when back in the day, the MagicCon idea is not a new one. The idea of a Magic Festival or the Magic Weekend, man, they ran that up the pole over and over and over again, and they just couldn't make it stick because they had these giant, you know, competitive events stuck with this supposedly casual thing when they just eventually learned you got to cut off that first part. Right. And then the rest will fall into place. Yeah, people don't like hearing that, but it's like, I mean, you know, the bottom line says it was the right play, sadly. <laughs> I mean, you know, biggest event of all time in Chicago, like Command Fest are selling out. The Amsterdam event is almost sold out. Like, these things are happening over and over again, and it's not because there's $50,000 events there. Like, it's just not. And that's wild to see how that changed over time and how we kind of got to be in the in the middle of it and see that transformation. And you can hear some lamentations of finishing tournaments at Waffle Houses in the pre-show if you want to check out our boomerness. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they we people got to hear some horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna move on some, here. Some some gamer trauma, if you will. I yeah, know, right? For sure. We're, we're going to move out of the first poke, or first pick rather, to gather the town's folk thanks to our sponsor, Mana Traders, the best tool to enhance your Magic Online experience. Use the code MAGICMIKES underscore T84 for 10% off your next subscription and tell them that we sent you. 
Uh, take a look here. What's going on? There was a fun auction that showed up. Uh, I don't even. I don't have the exact. The, the link's not working anymore like it used to. But yeah. the Alpha Crawl Worm uh, has been put up for auction. The last number I saw was something in the thirty thousand range. I'm not sure if that's a hundred percent. Yeah, which is funny because I think they were starting it at like twenty five hundred, and I'm like, Bruh. like that's going to be done in the first five minutes. <laughs> yeah, you're like, bro, what's what's going on with that? Um, Crawl worm, of course, for uh, back in the day, one of the cool beat sticks. You know, I can't believe you get this amount of power and stats for six mana, two green, four generic mana for a six four. You know, these days we make jokes about it, and it's been pa- bypassed eight hundred different ways. You know, this is about owning a piece of magic history. There's only so many alpha cards. It's still forty five bucks for an alpha version of crawl worm. I don't. That's silly, but it's an alpha card. So anything well, honestly, alpha. if I had the cat, like I probably even now, I if I would have probably bid up to five k for it. Oh yeah, this is a uh, thirty thousand. I, for the I probably would have done that. To be clear, yeah, the the original artwork, you can't you can't get those things just anywhere. Uh, they they are very rarely seen on the market. Rarely does alpha artwork make its way into like you know any sort of auction or whatever. I generally um, am going to be surprised if it doesn't get closer to 50. Somewhere in like the yeah. 42 to 50 range, I think, is where, where it can hit. Yeah. So it looks like, uh, so I'm in, I, I was trying to do some sleuthing here. Uh, looks like the most recent update is that there, it's currently going uh, going under authentication. And okay. once it's authenticated, uh-huh. then uh, auction will be officially started. There you go. Okay. Um, but, but uh that auction has not yet occurred, but it is pending. Yeah. Got so it. it'll be here eventually. Uh, I love this old stuff. Some of the artwork, like, because, again, no one, magic was weird. 1993, 1992, we don't know if any of this stuff is going anywhere. And, you know, there are multiple reports that paintings were just literally just washed over or just, you know, rinsed or whatever with, uh, you know, yeah. paint thinner and started over again because they needed the canvas and the canvas needed to be, yeah. you know, used for something else. So, well, in there's terms, also some that just got damaged. Some of the artists have died, and their stuff has been lost. Like fires. So many happen, of those pieces yeah. are just gone forever. Sadly, mm-hmm. right. In terms of images that are, when I think, when I close my eyes and I think magic card art, this crawl worm image is one of the first ones I think of. Mm. Now, I'm not sure I've even cast that many crawl worms in my life. Right. Oh, I know I did in the beginning. I mean, I've day. certainly cast one. I borrowed uh, a deck from Brian Kibler, and he has a deck that is all worms. Oh, wow. It just has every worm in it. That's all that's in it. And this, and he's got an alpha crawl worm in it, or a beta call, or whatever. The original art crawl worm in it. Sure. That might be the only time I've cast it since I was 12 years old. Because wow. uh, since then, it's been, you know, Yavi Maya worms, and Alpha Tyranax, and... Uh, Colossal Dreadmaw and like everything else that they've printed at that casting cost. So oh, yeah, it's um, not a good card. No, no I mean, of course. It's just, but I mean, in the even from my era. It was like the biggest creature we all had. Like right. that could, could fight a Shivan Dragon or whatever. Right. Like, Between you know. like this and Shivan Dragon and like Sarah Angel like and Savannah Lines, there's certain like just cards that I would be like, what is magic? What was magic when mm-hmm. I first found it? You know, like the Ice Manipulator from Ice Age, like Blinking Spirit from Ice Age, things that I were like were just seared into my brain. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of them. And I think that's that's wonderful. Man, in hindsight, that was kind of the green creature that everybody identified. But the others were way better because you got like Shiv and Dragon, Sarah Angel, uh, what you call <laughs> the Vampire yes, and Mama vampire. Modi Jin. Uh, like, oh, fat Modi, Paul man. Paul Perp's just not on that same level. Not even close. <laughs> like, it was kind of, it was weird. Particularly Singer Vampire, they didn't realize that, like, no one's going to block this creature if it gets a counter on it. So, like, yeah. it was, was kind of weird, but silly. They also did By the way, Tower that was one of the popular console. questions on the early judge test. Was, like, if you have a Singer Vampire with a lance on it, giving it first strike, how many Scrib Sprites have to block it to be able to kill it? Uh, Lord God. <laughs> that was That's actually great. a question. That's, what a great one. <laughs> That's a really good question, though. I love it. Um, all right. So moving on here, uh, there is, uh, of all the places to reach out, which I thought was certainly interesting, uh, IGN has reached out if you are a freelance author and know about Magic the Gathering. They're looking to commission some buying guides based on the best card game ever. The rate is 300 bucks per buying guide, and uh, by POC, LGBTQ plus and women writers are encouraged to apply, which I thought was really cool. 
And, you know, this is IGN putting money behind magic. And that's just something okay. I'll see every day. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, IGN is is one of these, like, big conglomerate uh, uh, amalgamators for content. So it's not horrifically surprising that they have someone specifically looking for people to create buying guides. Uh, but with that said, it's still very cool. It's still a cool thing to do. Um, and if you have the expertise... Uh, in this specific subset of uh, of magic, then it's it's a great opportunity. Yeah. yeah, and people, somebody did in their thread ask, why a buyer's guide and not gameplay? And what I don't think they understand is, like, there's a lot of other motivations there, right? It could be cross-promotion sure. things. It could be, they also can set it up to where they can generate links so they can make money off the articles. If you go buy the things that are recommended in these different buyer's guides, like, they right. can use it for promotions around the holidays, like, there's way more there than just gameplay to focus on for them from the business side. So there is an actual reason they're probably asking for specifically buyer's guides. Right. They're, the the hope is that this buyer's guide that they purchase from you is going to make them more than $300 that they spend for you to write it. Uh, right. In a variety of ways. However, you can do that. Again, advertising, referral links, and so on. Um, yep. But yeah, you know, somebody that large get into the space, honestly, just foretells that maybe other large gaming outlets, the game spots of the world, or... You know, I don't know, PC Gamer or something. Just I'm just right. thinking of, of, of different video game outlets, outlets that we see as almost yeah. com completely video games are now like, hey, Magic's pretty awesome. And even if there's a paper element, we could work on the paper element, maybe, you know, make some money off that while also promoting the arena version. Yeah, I think it is notable that, I mean, I, I can't recall IGN ever having done a, any sort of article series. They certainly do things like, the one ring sells for $2 million, right? Like they do stuff like that. But a series in which they're like, okay, well, we can actually make money off of some nuts and bolts right. selling guides. Some of this is uh, just SEO pretty, business, right? Just right. Good old I think that's yeah. pretty heartening, actually. Yeah, because they cover to... the big news otherwise. Like world championship stuff or whatever, they'll put a blurb out or whatever. But you're right. Like this is actually a cool idea that their magic is still so important, still kind of penetrating the nerd culture that they're like, hey, let's have some other stuff on here other than just that. Yeah, well, and there there has been, a not a recent spate, I wouldn't say, but a pretty consistent stream, no pun intended, of gaming creators who are bigger than Magic taking part in Magic, or at least speaking about Magic. I'm thinking of creators like, um, like Dr. Lupo coming in and doing some EDH shows and going to a yeah. Commander event soon. I'm speaking of Asmongold talking about Magic the Gathering on his stream. Um, you know, people uh, who are, you know, sort of outside of that space normally and we don't think of as Magic creators being like, oh, yeah, I play Magic. So let's move on here to Desperate Ravings and... For the first topic for Desperate Reason, this is a blog of talk that I came across and I was like, hmm, I feel like I understand where this is coming from. And let's just go ahead and bring it up so we can talk about it. Uh, basically, Mark Rosewater is going over the, the fact that we have a non-block model as kind of the default right now. Uh, the thing that pulls players uh, from sort of casual to enfranchise is making a product that speaks to them on a personal level. Like Bloomborough is going to just check so many people's boxes. Sure. And mm -hmm. that's going to be super dope. Um, the block model gave them one shot a year. If they hit it, awesome. You know, if you like, you know, Egypt, Amonkhet, you got it or whatever. Um, the current model, it just takes lots of different shots versus like one thing and another set that's the same thing, another set's the same thing. Theros for three sets and so on. Um, if you don't like anything, no sweat and yada, yada. And I get all that. And that's the power of the current system. Yes. Unless it's Ravnica. When it's Ravnica, you're going to get three big sets because Ravnica. And right. that, that something seems like Unless it's Karlov Manor. <laughs> well, well, I think there's like a main, at this point, there's a main Ravnica set, right? And there's yeah. almost like weird offshoots, like the Clue product, for example. Um, and I also think you saw MKM ain't exactly burning up the sales mm -hmm. charts. And when you don't have the guilds and you don't have the identities and you don't have the flavor that comes through as strongly, you got these characters that kind of come out of nowhere we've never really heard of versus the ones we know and we have heard of. You know, it, it doesn't seem to work as well. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's a hard balance to hit because you don't want to just 
this is the argument of like, you don't want to just make sequels. You don't want to just make remakes. Mm -hmm. You do want to make some new things. Uh, and the most recent Scream movie kind of had a joke about this where uh, the fan base will never let you fully reboot a franchise. Mm -hmm. So it's not a remake. It's a like a like a pre-boot or something they called some ridiculous term. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I don't think that there's a general rule that says when they go to a place and they don't stick to exactly what happened before, it fails, right? It, but people want the same amount of success whether or not the story changes. Star Wars has had this issue. You know, th this is not a magic specific issue. So I like it when they try new stuff. I like it when they try to go off the beaten path, introduce new characters and, and you know, do a little bit of something different. But there is a difference between going off the beaten path and getting lost in the woods and going yeah. so far away from what makes it a thing. Uh, you know, it's tough. It's a tough balance to reach. And I have um, you know, pity and sadness for the game designers when they realize that perhaps there is something in the story beyond their control that is taking uh, a take, taking a greater effect than the game rules. I think there's room, though, if they wanted to experiment, even with a couple of two set blocks, because to Rosewater's point, like, yes, the more variety of different planes you have, you increase the odds of finding a person who's going to like it. Right. But we do have these other now two sets a year of Universe Beyond plus a commander set or whatever every year now that, that's still giving you those opportunities to hit those touch points. So I don't think it would be weird to try a two set block and kind of maybe do it in 2025, then do it in 2026, see what the numbers are. If they check out, then maybe we go back to doing some block format stuff because you have enough opportunities to still hit a lot of new players with the release schedule that they have right now anyway. Well, I they're mean, doing something interesting with the story with Thunder Junction, by the way, that I wanted to point out where in the lore, this is part of the continuation of the Omen Paths saga. Mm -hmm. And the lore is that Omen Paths opened on a brand new plane where no one was there. And so now it's sort of like all of these travelers coming into this previously empty plane, mm -hmm. almost like Isekai the magic set, right? Where it's like, I got pulled out of my university and now I'm in medieval France kind of but it, that's everybody that's coming to this new plane. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a the furthest that you can take this of like, all right, there is nothing here to change. We are just drawing on a blank canvas. Mm -hmm. How crazy can we go? I guess we'll certainly see. And I think... Yeah, we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, beyond sort of the three sets of Ravnica, uh, which I think is a whole thing, the other half is that they tried two of the sets. They tried the Innistrad... You know, werewolf and the drawn vampire. And yeah. that was not great because it, the werewolf set wasn't very werewolfy and the vampire set was that was But again, notice this trend, right? We go we go all the way back to when we did Innistrad with the Cthulhu stuff. Mm -hmm. People didn't like it as much. Right? right. We tried to redo it and we made it this whole wedding weird thing and didn't really focus on there being werewolves, vampires, zombies, whatever, right? That's what people want from there. Right. We did a Ravnica set that didn't care about the guilds. And people didn't respond positively to it. So, Isn't like, weird? if you're going to give them a plane and there's a thing they like and that's what draws them to it, just give them the thing. I, just feed them the food they're asking for. That's all you got to do. You know, I think, and the other half is to just be more confident when they know they've got something good. Like, they knew right. Ka Neo, you know, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty was good. They knew it. Everybody knew it. I can only imagine how excited they were when they saw all the artwork, all the artwork coming in. The woodblock artwork was incredible. I mean, the, the frames were awesome. The gameplay was sweet. Like, they could not have not known this was had a very good chance at absolutely killing it. And to have that confidence to go into one more set would have been absolutely huge. And obviously, we're going to get that set eventually, and that's great. But, like... And this is where I go on my rant about fix the bad stuff because no one has good memories of the bad stuff, but they have memories because nostalgia exists. So when you return to Homelands and you return to Mercadian Masks, you're going to make it awesome and then have that confidence to say, you know what, we're going to spend two sets in these old, broken and or bad sets, quote unquote, but because we fixed them and we made them cool and now we continue to make them like, you know, one more iteration cool, I would have killed for another Kamigawa set as many would have. Uh, and obviously I asked for it for a long time, but like the fact that they killed it so hard was just, you know, to me a moniker of like, 
I think they're focusing too much on the winning sets and not so much on the sets that didn't do great that they now know how to infuse with some excitement. Oh, yeah, because I'm with you. They literally basically blew up and started over on Kamigawa. Like, they tried to connect the stories and, you know, whatever, but, like, it sure. basically was a whole new Kamigawa. Right. And they doubled down on anime weebos and, you know, just went for it. So, like, right. gotta love that idea. Right. So they did a lot of that stuff right, which kind of brings me to our Going Infinite segment, which we had seen online. Saffron Olive uh, over at MPG Goldfish had tweeted out that, and this is another thing that drives me nuts, that Outlaws of the Thunder Junction is the 100th set release, depending on how you look at it, quote unquote, Wizards. Right. This is, it's your product. You can call it the 100th if you want. You make the rules, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, we're 100 sets in. And excluding things like from the vaults and, you know, whatever, and commander decks or whatever. What's the best set, premier set release? What's the worst set release? Where do you start on that? My worst was Fallen Empires. Mm -hmm. I actively, literally actively played during Fallen Empires on the shelves of game stores, and it was terrible. You thought Homelands was bad? Fallen Empires was like... Homelands was depression and like Fallen Empires was deep, deep depression. Like real, real can't get out of bed type depression. Like it was real bad, y'all. We literally almost killed Magic. So that was my worst. And my best set release uh, for me is Dominaria. That's the 2018 version. I got a box of it right over there behind me because I love the hell out of that set. If you look at the people who worked on that set, like it is the murderers, Roe, Garfield, Rosewater, like Verhey there with, you know, like all the sweetest developers were there. Like it was incredible. You know, Aaron Forsyth was on it. Everybody was on that set. And it was beautiful. And so I got into an argument with Flores, Mike Flores, as I want to do, where he was like, well, what about the original Ravnica? And I'm like, dude, I think you're thinking of different things. For yeah. me, when I say, when someone comes up to me and says like, what's the, what is the magic set? And I go, this one, because it's got good, it's got good cards and all the different rarities. The limited is an absolute masterpiece. The cards are really interesting and work together well. The innovative mechanics are fantastic. And Ravnica, when you look at the first set, is cool, but you needed all three sets, you know, for that Ravnica draft experience. The OG Ravnica was just fantastic. The OG first set Ravnica was fine. I didn't hate it, but like once you got all three sets, it was amazing. So that to me, and he's like, you know, Ravnica standard. I'm like, we're not talking about standard decks that come out of sets. What sets would I give to someone to say like, this is magic? Like, what is that set? I, I'm about? I'm not upset though with either of those picks as as somebody's best set though. Totally I think fun. those those are both reasonable. I, yeah. That's nothing crazy. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, my worst set by yeah. far is is Homelands. Like I don't like because the reason is at least with Fallen Empires. I still had him to Turok. I still got some of the knights that I played in decks. I still got High Tide. Like, mm. I think the only thing I really played out of Homelands was like Autumn Willow. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, think Ishan Shade got a little bit, just a hair, at least a Yeah, I don't even think I, I like put that Ishan in a deck. Shade. But yeah, there yeah. wasn't Serrated much there. Serrated Arrows. Serrated Arrows was the big one. That was the yeah, only one. Like, there, was, there wasn't much in, in no. Homelands. So, like, that, that one's pretty easy for me. Mm. Best Tempest. Yeah, that's not that's good, the one great for me. shout out. But Hell there's yeah. cards that just stood the test of time. You know, when you're talking about wasteland, you drink so many of like the random enchantments and stuff there. Curse Scroll changed how we played magic entirely because before that it was all about having the most cards and card economy and all this. Like it really changed a lot of stuff. And cards were fun to play with. The different environments for limited and standard were super sweet. I mean, you still were trying to deal with, like, the Urza stuff that followed and whatever. That was a whole to-do. But the Tempest era was actually pretty nice. Yeah. And lots of sweet art that still holds up now, which is really cool in that set. So, yeah, lots of lots of reasons I would go back and recommend that set to people. Really powerful stuff that wasn't hard to understand and kind of just set the stage for a lot of things for the next couple of years, you know, after it came out. Man, I was planning on having to shout out Tempest because no one would remember it. But that's a that, – man – I knew I liked you. Tempest has some um, of my favorite card and Tempest my least favorite card ever in Magic yeah. in the same set, in Humility. I love yeah. it. I mean, Shadow kind of just drug it down for me in terms of, like, making it be the best. I didn't like the sure. Shadow mechanic. It's just flying plus plus, you know? Yeah, um, and but I, it was real flavorful and it told the story. Oh, it was super cool. Um, I mean, this was what, Rosewater's first set design lead, right? I think so. It also Around had a really time. important uh, role in the creation of Magic as a hobby as opposed to a fad. Mm. Like 
Tempest mm, was that's when, a good point. was like was when sales went back up for the first time after the lull uh, of Mirage before Mirage. Well, that. ironically, that idea that you can like really make that block structure work, right, and tell that yep. story in that specific way. They struggled, God, they struggled forever to try to tell stories through magic cards, and that was yep. one of the first ways they really like put it on the cards. Yeah. I mean, both of you guys have like great arguments. Uh, when I tweeted earlier, I said that the, so I think that there's an argument to be made that the best president was George Washington, and there's an argument to be made that the best set was Alpha, right? Like you're not going to get better than Alpha because it was no, first. I was like, where are we you going with this? You like, can't argue on Alpha. Uh, it's like okay, I get it. You know. Mine, my best set is Innistrad. I think that they went so weird and it paid off. I think that they took so many chances in Innistrad that paid off, uh, and and it was the highest roll of any set that they've made. It was. Perfect flavorfully. It was perfect from a story perspective. The hype was great. Transform ended up working really well. The draft environment was spectacular. Uh, and the world was indelible in people's minds and became a new home plane for people. So that one I, I would put as my best uh, as my best set. And I'm going to go not super recent, but more recent than Fallen Empires and Homelands. My, my worst set is Prophecy. Uh None trash. of the yeah, that's none fair. of the mechanics really worked bad. in yeah. prophecy. Like nothing was good. Uh, we have Ristic Study is the most expensive card from that set. A common, it was a common, uh, and yeah, it's that's just bad. There's, there's very little poorly. memorable. Innistrad is super duper special because you know I was there, y'all. I was there when when the rumor came over the wire. When the first time I heard that they're going to have double faced magic cards, I hear like. How? How are you going to do that? How is it not going to be cheating? How are you going to play it limit? I don't understand. And like, you know, the checklist cards were not shown for many weeks. It was just a weird rumor of double-faced cards and everyone going like, there's no way they can do that. That's ridiculous. And it was awesome. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point, though. It, it set up a, a printing situation that we can now do for a variety of stuff, which they've used a bunch of different ways now, oh, yeah. even for just basic tokens. So you can put more variety of tokens in a set. But I, but I think to your point, Ruben, it's actually, as far as I can remember, in modern Magic, the first time they used like what we could consider real-world tropes and put them into the game in a while, right? When you're talking about having the werewolves and the vampires and whatever, right? Like going to that level. For sure. That we really didn't have before. Since, yeah. like, you know, the dark with, like, the Headless Horseman and, you know, all that other stuff, or Legends, I guess. But that was actually a pretty good point, too, that maybe that's also opening the door to, like, well, if people like this, we can try all this other stuff now that we wouldn't have done before. Right. It, and it and Innistrad led to things like New Capenna existing. And, yeah. sure. you know. And, you know, they have, A, they have the opportunity this fall, I think, or no, next year, I believe it is, with, um, like, the 80s horror set. Yeah. How far are they going to mm -hmm. go? We don't know. Um, but with Innistrad, you know, there was a lot of really defining the idea that we can go from the top down. We can take the scary stories and turn them into magic cards. We can take the scary monsters and turn them into magic cards and make sure that all of that flavor is there. And if anything, I think you could argue that it was Innistrad more than any other set that led the ability for them to make universes beyond just kind of fit yeah. into the fold. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't this crazy thing. They could take something and turn it into a magic card. No, they've taken concepts into magic cards, entire sets concepts into magic cards. Hell yeah, they can do it for Marvel or Lord of the Rings or Assassin's Creed or whatever because they've done it. They know how to make these things gel and that was what was so great about it. Yeah. Uh, so fantastic choice there. Um, last little bit here, a little splash damage before we get out of here. Things that are not quite related to magic, but they're kind of related to magic. Uh, Chris Cox could arguably have said to have stepped in a little bit when he was talking about AI and D and D and what that means in a uh, Wargamer interview. The Hasbro CEO Chris Cox optimistic about AI and D and D and Magic's future. Not a lot of people are. Uh, and certainly, there's some artists who reached out and were like, "Yo." This is not cool. And all those people who spent all that time making all those worlds and, and books and things, yes, you can crunch a uh, you know some AI language you know munchers on it and see what they spit out, but that doesn't mean it's going to be good, and that doesn't mean it's going to fulfill people's hopes and dreams for the new D&D release. Yeah. You know what, though? I, I did a video on this last week because I knew people were going to read the header mm -hmm. and not read the context of the interview. Right. And he actually did an interview on VentureBeat, I think is where it first was done. 
And there's a point where he even mentions not they're not trying to use it to replace artwork and story or whatever or the human element because they know there's a community and things to protect, especially as far as how it pertains to magic and D&D. He even said that in the interview, right? What he was pointing at was examples of how, I think he said it toward the end of last year around Halloween leading up to it, they had some type of like Ouija board thing or something online and like people could go mess with whatever and it was AI driven. and. Right. That raised awareness of stuff. And then I think on, I, could, I didn't know there was a thing, but I guess like National Trivia Month, they had AI come up with a bunch of questions that people would go on and answer for Trivial Pursuit stuff. Cool. And he said, because of that, they raised sales of Trivial Pursuit for like so many weeks for like 30%, right? So he's like, hey, we're now looking at all of our brands, including Magic and DMD and whatever, and saying like, how can we utilize this right. to help raise awareness or increase sales or whatever, which could be anything. They might just load in a map of Ravnica and then you can tour Ravnica and it gives you info on each of the different locations or something. Or yeah. you can do a thing where you can talk to a character or some such and they just feed it a bunch of info and it makes up responses or whatever it happens to yeah. be. Mm -hmm. But I knew people were going to jump in and go, oh, that's it. When magic gets AI, I'm out of here or whatever. And I was like, that's not what he said, though. Yeah. Like, y'all are making me defend the bad guy. Stop. You know, like, there, that's, there that's is not a what happened. difference. There is nuance here and people hate nuance. Yeah. Um, Can we just but, slam them and get over with? But yeah. you like nuance, viewers and listeners to our show, and that's why we're here. Is we're that's getting into we're the nitty gritty. There are things that AI is good at. There are things that AI is better at, and they are the things that humans do not wish to do, and that humans would prefer or 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 are required to go faster. There is good artificial intelligence. There is also bad artificial intelligence. And a lot of what we're fighting against as artists, as creators, as you know, people in the world, is people creating AI to replace uh, things that humans are good at and want to do. Right. You're not making things go faster. You're not making things better. You're just making things cheaper. And uh, iterative AI is primarily the culprit here. <laughs> Um, but there is ethical AI and there is unethical AI. And primarily unethical AI is people making things to replace things that we want to be doing already. The people who have founded like Mid Journey and um, Sora Studios and stuff like that, that, those people, instead of learning how to make art, learned how to code and taught robots how to create art. And that's not art. That's coding. They, they showed them how to remix, right? They showed right. them yeah, how basically. to take elements and put them together. Right. So if but. you don't want to spend 20 years to become a master, uh, sorry, uh, but there are people out there who are masters. And we're all on the same page uh, among oh, yeah, those yeah. here because sure. we're all creatives. But the, the thing is that 80% of the world don't have a creative job or hobby. I think uh, most people are, you know... Not not painting in their spare time, not you know creating podcasts in their spare time, right. and so they don't see this nuance. There is good AI. This There's good would uses. You possibly know, be okay. I think you can look at it, and this is going to happen. It doesn't matter, obviously, what our opinions are, but you know, think of it. I think in a couple different ways. One, it would be. You know, if you're uh, creating and say in D and D a module, and there's an innkeeper, and you don't want to write the backstory for the innkeeper, you don't want to try to explain every dialogue choice they could ever have. Yep. You just say they're an innkeeper, and they're not going to be very talkative. And you can just have them spit out some things that an innkeeper who's not very talkative would say. But if that innkeeper is very important to the story, that's the one you script out, and you get the voice actors, and you yep. do the whole thing because that's a very important part of your of the thing. So to me, that tangential stuff that you can just kind of say. This person says things as, as this thing, you know, that's cool because as long as you're important, things that are the most important to your story and or, you know, your game or whatever you're making, you know, are, are human influenced and human written uh, and human performed, that that's the most important part. I think um, there's another thing here, too, though, that people don't understand that artificial intelligence is a huge category. Yes. Right. I think. A lot of people didn't start thinking about AI until the last year or two once they started seeing all the artwork and everything else popping up. Right. And now that's kind of what they associate with it. But people don't realize, I mean, even your cell phone you're carrying around, you, when you talk to the Google Assistant or whatever, like that's a version of AI that's doing searching for you, you know, giving you calculations, setting your timers when you're in the kitchen, like 
all of that falls under that category as well. So there's a lot of things you can do with it that aren't nefarious, that aren't taking jobs away from people. They're just helping you do other things well. Right. So I think it's understanding the category as well. So you can at least visualize, you know, to his point, like making a crazy trivia thing to just create questions for people. And then all of a sudden people want to go buy Trivial Pursuit, right? So there's things you can do with it. And it's just putting people toward that think tank to figure out what you can do. Right. As a marketer, as a guy who does yeah. marketing professionally, AI has moved has moved into marketing. It is a marketing term now. Oh, it's, it's everywhere. Just like, it's just like blockchain. Blockchain started to be added onto everything. People would put blockchain in their names on the stock market and their stock would go up because it had the word stock blockchain in it. They just loved a blockchain. And now they just love an AI and everything is AI driven and everything is AI powered and AI so-and-so. And it's just a different word for the computer helps you do things. It's just how it's doing them. Is different. Hell, I saw they had to take a book off Amazon, I think it was, because somebody had written it with AI. Oh, I yeah, think there's that a was bunch like, of them out there. And somebody had won an award, I think, also oh, with the AI book, and they had to like take the award away or whatever it was. So yeah, Good. it's already everywhere. Yeah. I also uh, have a personal gripe against AI because they plug my resume into an AI and then tell me that I'm not qualified for a job. I'm talking to you, Dude, LinkedIn. Dude, they've been using that for a long time. I know. Like, wow. That's a thing that's like that's 12 worst. years old or so, the technology for that. Hey, and a bunch of people AI. have lost jobs because of that. Yeah. Right. But now it's AI, so that's different. And right. that means Yeah, exactly. We give it a different name. but Somebody programs spot. the program. Every yep. algorithm is made by somebody. There is always someone to blame. Yeah, and now yes, it's the AI. So the AI gets to be the, the marketing power. All right. Let's, before uh, we before we head out, I have one more tag to add to our earlier crawl worm story. Sure. Uh, I have been uh, accepted to join the MTG Art Market Group. Nice. Uh, they are currently at 70000 on the bid from a private bidder. Nice. They have not yet hit the reserve for the the bid yet, uh, but they are a day or two out from seeing if they hit the reserve or not. So nice. uh, it seems they did get it authenticated. Bids were coming in and and flying, and it got up to seventy k as most recently as two days ago. Oh, and seventy k was not the reserve, not yet. Wow, yeah, probably a, probably a good hundo would be the reserve. I thought it would have been around forty or fifty. Wow, okay. crazy. It's, you know, yeah, I don't know what the reserve call. reserve is not listed. You know, it's funny in the in the chat here at Twitch, uh Narvun, Var, Narvuntian, I don't know how to say that right. Narvunchen. Anyway, it says algorithms and AR are different though. They don't care. They don't care. Marketing right. don't care. Marketing don't care. Marketing just wants you to get interested. And if I, I can say AI they are different. And mm -hmm. it's an algorithm, but I can say AI because I'm gonna, because marketing, marketing. Yeah. The algorithm care. is what I'm angry at about LinkedIn. That's a fair point. Sure, sure. Fair point. All right. Let's turn the corner here to the finisher. Lorcana is finally coming out with comp rules in the next few days, which apparently will include best of two matches. That's a new one to me. So tell me, what other ways do you have to determine wins and losses, Ruben? Well, I'm a soccer fan, so I suggest a two-game home-and-home series where the tiebreaker will go to whoever got the most lore while on the draw. And if that's also tied, then it goes to whoever has the longest drive home. Nice. That seems fair. Yeah. Power <laughs> Dragon? All right, as a WWE fan, I like a championship belt system where you got to beat the person who won the previous event. Because, you know, to be the man, you got to beat the man. But... Outside interference should be legal if the referee doesn't see it. There yeah. you go. Hell I didn't yeah. notice. You get in there with the elbow, you know, with the chair. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I don't see stuff. Well, look. And every once in a while, you need a six-person match to determine who the new champion yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. It needs to be a ladder. Hell, hell in a cell. Yeah, a ladder you know. match. Exactly. Right. It needs to have chain link fencing around. Right. Now, as a Counter-Strike fan, I like starting things out with a best of one. Then for eliminations and big matchups, you get to move to best of three. And, of course, you get an automatic additional point for not cheating. Please don't. That's tough. I mean, auto point for not cheating is, uh, I don't mind that. That's Valorant's great. having some serious problems right now, so uh, feel free to Google and look up that if you'd like. Hey, hey. And that ends another live episode of Magic Mike. Thanks for joining us here to discuss all things magic. Thank you, Power Dragon. Hey, as always, good to be here. Don't forget to review and leave us the five stars, because that's always helpful. Always. Thank you, Ruben. Hey, partners, next week we're going to start talking about Thunder Junction. So I'm, I'm not going to get my hat this week. Then. 
Yeah. Pew, pew, get them how cowboy hats ready. It's going to see happen. you next Wednesday, friends. Woohoo! We're going to move here. Yeehaw, if you will, as we move here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co sponsor, Manage Raiders, my co host, Power Dragon, and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching and listening, and hope you support us at patreon.com slash magic mics. Please follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us on our exclusive member Discord, live on twitch.tv at magic mics, live or taped on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at magic mics cast and on, join our TikTok at magic mics cast, or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mike's. Good night, everybody.